So the human needs map. Why do I call it a treasure? Because there's so much, there's so many stories and so much to be discovered within this journey of, um, of needs unfolding. We are all familiar with Maslow and Maslow is sort of the, the go-to triangle that helps us think of needs as a sequential sort of satisfying uh, ex life experience that we satisfy one need and then we progress to the next need until we achieve some level of self-actualization. And what I've found is that Maslow was looking at sort of a, a positive psychology of human potential, but he wasn't looking at conflict. Conflict and suffering was the major motivation of why I created, you know, what I have been trying to figure out. And so some of the people that I went to, in addition to, of course, Maslow, was Galtung, who was father of peace studies, Max Neef, who was a, a major um, innovator in human scale development, which, of course, is very relevant for those of us interested in social change, the transition movement, which I've been part of, um, and the sustainability movement, which I think most of us in this circle are engaged with. Then you have people like Seitz and Burton who were theorists who Burton particularly developed human needs theory as a theory to talk about in conflict. He was a diplomat and he took a lot from a, another sociologist Seitz. Then of course we all know Rosenberg for nonviolent communication. All of these wonderful people, um, it's, a, it's sort of a flashboard of human needs, but nothing really makes sense. It's, it's not, a, it's not there, you don't see the interaction between the needs. You also are missing something which I think is really important. Um, two things. One is that, and the way I sort of helped make sense of it, is I group needs into categories. And I call these categories hungers. And what's in green here I, I be, became for me the hunger for love, the hunger for survival, the hunger for meaning. But there's another hunger that plays out consistently and tragically within all of our lives and in, in when you look at, at international conflict, um, and that's the hunger for power. So that's a, that's a hunger that's included. Also, most of these needs are also are included in my map, but there's another, but there's a need that's not included that you don't see, and that's the need for physical aliveness. And so as I began, you see physical nurturance, but that's different quality than the juiciness of pleasure and pain. And it was important for me to include that body centered embodied experience in any conversation that has to do with conflict because of the tragic history and relationship between sex and violence and pleasure. So um, that helped me evolve the first step of the map and why there's a sort of a logical coherence be behind this map is that I put these four hungers and I saw them as a developmental process. And you can see this, I'm also a mother and a grandmother. As soon as a baby, is, an infant is born, the child is, has the capacity of the moral reflex of going into this extreme startle, which you do not want to do to an infant. Um, so fear is the primal emotion that is the earliest of all emotions. At about the age of that first beginning year of years of life, first year, year and a half, it's all about being loved and cared for, being cared about and being, being attended to, being, being able to be understood, being able to feel held and embraced and warm and fed. If that doesn't happen, you invariably see a very sad child. At about the age of two and a half, we notice in our children the capacity to express an emotion that comes up in a very interesting way when they discover their boundaries, their separateness. And they enter a phase of, called the terrible twos and they really know how to do that emotion. They get really good at saying no. 
And then at about the age of three and a half, they begin to internalize goodness and badness. And as mothers, as when I was a young mother, I learned how to make the difference between saying what you did was bad rather than you're a bad boy. Because the child would inherently internalize the badness as an experience of shame. And these primary emotions, which I've, I, it seems, you know, this model is, is, is as perfect and imperfect as perfect as every model. So my reasoning is that there is a, there seems to be a pattern here that we also see in, um, in terms of primary emotions that can be seen in blind children and in adults. But we also see that plays itself out as we progress. Oh, I forgot to include. This picture is what happens when we feel really well, when we feel safe, when we feel loved, when we feel that we can have impact in our life, that we can have a will that can have impact, and that we feel that we have value and that we are valued, that we know who we are. And when that happens, we feel really the joy of happiness. And it, it just brings a smile, I believe, to all of our faces when we see these smiling, joyful faces. So now, what I've done now is made a bridge, which I think is, was crucial to make, and that's the relationship between emotions and human needs. What it says is that emotions are an energy or a call to get our needs met. Emotions are a reflection. They're a energetic urge, a um, a mobilizing force that tells ourselves and that tells the outside world that something's wrong or something's right. So here is how this map can help us make, help us organize ourselves when we look at the conflicts in our groupings, in our tribes in our cultures, in our communities, in our families. Whenever there's a group, we're gonna invariably see these dynamics play out. So the first set, uh, this first quartet of tribal needs begins with, am I being fairly treated? Am I being fairly treated and can I trust? So for example, something as banal, something as boring as if I'm going to have, a, if I'm going into a parking lot, so I grew up in LA and if there's a parking space, a parking lot, and there's only space for, for, there's a minimal amount of space and some car is taking up two parking spaces, it's, it's like a broken agreement of the rules of fairness that I'm not, I'm not being treated fairly. Are those rules really clear to everyone in the group? The next thing is, and what part of what informs what the rules of fairness are, is my identity, who am I? What are the values that guide my behavior or the behavior of my group? Does my group know where it's going? Does my group allow me to feel connected? And of course, um, rituals are profound ways of an embodied practice that's shared. It's like breathing together, it's chanting together, it's lighting candles together. It's anything that's gonna reinforce a sense of interconnectedness and belonging is gonna strengthen the tribal need of, of belonging. And all and of safety. Do I feel secure and at ease that everything is clear to me, that the rules are clear, that I am, there's a certain predictability to my, to my tribe, that we're living according to our values, that we have the resilience to get, engage in a conflict and get to the other side. In this way, conflict in traditional cultures, as well as in practices like restorative justice, it shows that you can go into a conflict is an opportunity to strengthen the values of the community, to show that fairness is going to be met by the community, and that ultimately we are gonna, we're gonna stay connected because we share these values which brings me ease and safety in my tribe and all of the strengthens the tribe. The next set of needs, the next quartet of needs are the individual needs. 
And these needs strengthen me in the tribe. I'd like to mention that I have all of these eight needs moving in me. You have all of these eight needs you, moving in you. But in terms of the needs that are particularly relevant when we're trying to make sense of how to strengthen the tribe and how to strengthen me in the tribe and which needs I may exaggerate or not exaggerate and so forth, which gets into a more, a, some more sophisticated um, use of this model right now. This is just an introduction to the model. Um, we're going to say at what are the four needs that are particularly relevant when I think about how do I strengthen myself in my tribe? The first one is, do I feel I'm seen and understood in my tribe? If I feel that I'm seen and understood, then I'm going to feel strong within my tribe. I feel people get me. I feel connected to the people around my in my tribe. If I feel that my, the people around me value me, value what I say, respect me and whatever that looks like, because respect is gonna look different depending upon social, economic, class, culture, language, historical moment. I should let you know that I am a social anthropologist. So I see it from that perspective as an anthropologist. Autonomy. Autonomy is a very powerful need. It is the need that gives us the capacity to exert my will. So for example, the two-year-old, when the two-year-old discovers its autonomy, the two-year-old loves, and I had, I had three sons, I have three sons, so my boys would love to build a tower so they could destroy it. You know, little children love to do things so that they can see the impact of their will. Well, it gets only more sophisticated as we get older. And that ability is primary to my ability to stand on my own two feet, to live an independent life, to be able to express myself, and to stand in relationship with people so that I feel strong within my relationships, within my tribe, within my group. And here, physical aliveness for me, even though it's the last, it's actually the first. Because for me, this is where I notice what's the status of my needs Do, on the gradient, on, on the range between the, what's called the hedonic value from pleasure to pain, from pain to pleasure. This is where we sequence as we notice, as we respond to the level of safety and unsafety in our environment. And so when I feel vitality and alive, that can only be that can only be true when I have a certain degree of safety. So these, these four needs are what I would say are the primary individual needs that we see that get activated within myself and within my group. Together, these individual and tribal needs increase our survival, both as individuals, but also as groups. So each of these needs, each of these hungers are categories and they're represented by these two needs, a need pair, one which strengthens the individual and one which strengthens the tribe. And they're in dynamics. We'll often see the play out as we start unra unwrapping your conflicts between fairness and recognition. I don't feel seen, you're treating me unfairly, or I wanna be in my own, but yet I want to be connected. In the same way, I want you to, to trust me, but you're not trusting me. I don't feel safe if you trust me. Or I feel depleted because I, my values are on the line. I have to give up my values. I have to give up my basic juiciness in life in order to have a certain kind of identity. So this dynamic becomes really fascinating as we map out conflict. 